My dear friends in Christ, you know, and I'm sure that Father Casimir explained it to you in the course of the first conference, that in our day of recollection, we follow the four steps of preparation for the act of total consecration as outlined by St. Louis Marie de Montfort. So Father Casimir spoke to you on the renouncement of the spirit of the world, and the second step is knowledge of self. And in order to help all of us understand what St. Louis means by this second step, I would like to go back briefly to the first step of renouncement of the world. Before one can pursue a spiritual life, a life of consecration to Almighty God, a life of striving to do more than the ordinary, one must first of all renounce the corrupt spirit of the world. And this reminds me of a story of one of the saints, I don't recall which one, but he lived in the Middle Ages and he was very vain, very much taken up with the spirit of the world, very concerned with what other people thought of him, his image, reputation, and so forth. And one day he was wearing a very expensive new suit of clothing, and he's riding his horse through the town very proudly, hoping everybody was noticing him. And for whatever reason, the horse reared, and he was thrown off the horse, and it had rained shortly before, so he fell into the mud. And he got up, and his clothing was just covered with mud. And the people who were around who saw this began to laugh, to make fun of him. And he said to himself, he said, I will get even with you, cruel world. You make fun of me, I will mock you. And he gave up everything. And he began to live a good spiritual life and became a canonized saint. But it all began with that one accident, that one event permitted by divine providence, which made him realize the folly of living for the esteem of the world. And we probably all have different circumstances like that in our life, obviously not quite as dramatic, but instances where we come to realize how empty is the praise and the esteem of the world. And then we think to ourselves, why do I care so much about what people think, what their opinion is of me? Chasing after the things that the world esteems is so empty, such a waste of time, so foolish, really. And so we, we understand that, and then we come to the conclusion, I must live a more spiritual life. I must concentrate on heaven, trying to earn heaven by the way I live. But then we come up against another obstacle that maybe we didn't even realize existed. We probably knew it was there, but because we were so taken up with the world and the things of the world and the esteem of the world, We didn't fully understand what an enemy we have within. This was expressed by one holy religious who wrote about this when he entered the novitiate. So he became a religious, as a young religious, a postulant as we say. Then he becomes a novice and he goes to the religious house that is called the novitiate. And there he was brought up face to face with his fallen human nature. And he wrote about this in his diary. And he he said, I came to understand that there were two of us. And it was my job to throw the other one out the window, was his way of putting it. In other words, he realized that he had within him this fallen human nature, this Adam self, this other life, that was fighting against the spiritual life. Because we... We go through this great effort to renounce the spirit of the world, and we feel pretty good about ourselves. We finally conquer, or for the most part, that, that so great concern about what other people think, and so on and so forth, and judging and thinking along the lines of the spirit of the world. And we get past that, 
And then we come to realize, I've just started. Now I have to overcome self. And the more we strive to grow, we meditate, we say our rosaries, we do our spiritual reading, the more we come to understand what an obstacle we have within. And this is an obstacle that we can't run away with, uh, away from. Because wherever you go, you will find that fallen human nature. It follows you. And it manifests itself in different ways, but especially with pride. And all the different manifestations of pride. Where does it come from? This fallen human nature that we all have. It comes from original sin. And that is why it is sometimes referred to as the life of Adam. It is a result of original sin. But even though original sin was washed from our soul, thanks be to God, in the wonderful sacrament of baptism. And we were reborn to the supernatural life. We were adopted by God into his family. We became adopted children of God in temples of the Holy Ghost. What a wonderful thing baptism is. And yet, that cleansing of original sin from the soul does not wash away the effects of original sin primary of which is concupiscence. What is concupiscence? A big word. Concupiscence merely means a strong inclination to sin. And we all have it, and we are all very aware that that is part of our life. Matter of fact, there was one saint who said, you will be lucky if your fallen human nature dies 15 minutes before you do. Meaning that it's always going to be there right up until the end of our lives. We will always have to struggle against it. So the first thing we need to do is to pray for the grace to be aware of it. St. Augustine said that famous prayer, Lord, grant that I may know myself so that I may know thee. We have to pray for knowledge of self which means an awareness, a realization of this strong inclination to evil that exists within us that's constant pulling down, pulling us back from striving to love and serve God. So I want to read to you, it is like an examination of conscience, from a meditation, a reading, from the wonderful book, The Imitation of Christ. Now, you know that the imitation of Christ was written in, I think, the 12th century. Most scholars believe that the author was a religious named Thomas Akempis, who lived in in Holland. But the things that he wrote, he claims, came from his spiritual director or superior, whose name was, I think, um, Gerard Groot. At any rate, it is one of the most beautiful books ever written. Many will say that after sacred scripture itself, which really is not a human book, but a divine book, that this is the most profound spiritual book ever written, the imitation of Christ. The wonderful thing about the imitation of Christ is that sometimes when we are going through a trial, when we need spiritual guidance or to be uplifted, you can take the imitation of Christ, say a Hail Mary, and just open it at random. And it seems that you come upon the very thing you need at that point. So this is going to be, uh, I'll read at least some of the meditation or the reading called The Different Motions of Nature and Grace. So the author here is talking about how fallen nature inclines us one way and God's grace enlightening us inclines us the opposite way. We have this, this battle going on and we at least have to begin with recognizing that conflict, recognizing which motion within me or or of the motions within me, which are good and which are bad, which are a result of fallen human nature and which inclinations come from God's grace enlightening me. So let us listen. My son, 
the voice of Christ, my son, observe diligently the motions of nature and grace because they move in very opposite and subtle ways and can hardly be distinguished but by a spiritual man and one that is internally illuminated. In other words, we need the grace of the Holy Ghost to detect, to identify that inclination. Is it from God or is it from my fallen nature? And he says here that that nature and grace move in opposite and very subtle ways. Sometimes we think, I'm acting from a good motive, but then upon further examination we realize it's a very selfish motive. Self is so subtle. It disguises its movements and its its inclinations and its designs under spiritual garb, where in reality it's a very selfish movement. The author goes on, All men indeed aim at good and pretend to something good in what they do and say. Therefore, under the appearance of good, many are deceived. And now he begins to draw the the contrast. Nature is crafty and draws away many. She ensnares and deceives them and always has self for her end. But grace walks with simplicity, turns aside from all appearance of evil, offers no deceits, and does all things purely for God, in whom she rests as in her last end. Nature is not willing to be mortified or to be restrained or to be overcome or to be subject. Neither will she of her own accord be brought under. But grace studies the mortification of her own self, resists sensuality, seeks to be subject, covets to be overcome, aims not at enjoying her own liberty, loves to be kept under discipline, and desires to have the command not to have the command over anyone, but under God, ever to live, stand, and be. And for God's sake, is ever ready humbly to bow down to all human creatures. Nature labors for her own interest and considers what gain she may reap from another. But grace considers not what may be advantageous and profitable to herself, but rather what may be profitable to many. Nature willingly receives honor and respect, but grace faithfully attributes all honor and glory to God. Nature is afraid of being put to shame and despised, but grace is glad to suffer reproach for the name of Jesus. Nature loves idleness and bodily rest, but grace cannot be idle and willingly embraces labor. Nature seeks to have things that are curious and fine and does not care for things that are cheap and coarse. But grace is pleased with that which is plain and humble, rejects not coarse things, nor refuses to be clad in old clothes. Nature has regard to temporal things, rejoices at earthly gain, is troubled at losses, and is provoked at every slight injurious word. But grace attends to things eternal and cleaves not to those which pass with time. Neither is she disturbed by the loss of things, nor exasperated with hard words. For she places her treasure and her joy in heaven, where nothing is lost. Nature is covetous and is more willing to take than to give, and loves to have things to herself. But grace is bountiful and open-hearted, avoids selfishness, is contented with little, and judges it a more blessed thing to give rather than to receive. And I've only read about half the meditation. It's chapter 54 of the third book, but it serves as a good examination of conscience. We, at the end of the day, examine ourselves and we say, well, when I did this, when I did that, was I motivated by selfishness? self-centeredness or was I motivated by the love of God and striving to do things for God's honor and glory 
So once again, it is a good examination of conscience to make because very often we delude ourselves that we are acting from good motives when in reality it was a very self-centered motive. And as I said, we have to be very much on our guard against pride. St. Louis Marie de Montfort points out in the book True Devotion on the importance of death to self, he says, even in the good we do, there is sometimes this selfish satisfaction that vitiates. In other words, it, it takes away the merit because we take pride. Look what I did. We, we feel good about it. And even when we start to think about the good we do, we are already beginning to take pride, take a selfish delight in having done the right thing, and maybe we lose the merit because of pride. So we have to be so much on our guard against that. And to overcome pride, which is a daily battle that will last for the rest of our lives, pride is our number one vice. The number one capital sin. You list the seven capital sins, the first one is pride. Pride is the beginning of every sin, of all evil. All evil takes its, its root from pride. Pride is the root of all evil. So to overcome it, we have to reflect that nothing of good that I have is from myself. All the good that I have, all the good I can do is only by the grace of God. It is only with God's help that I can perform a good action, that I can practice virtue. So what does it take to sanctify ourselves. What is sanctity? Sanctity is growing closer to God. It's developing a deeper union with God, becoming more united with God. What do we say when we receive the Holy Eucharist? We say, I went to Holy Communion. What does that word mean, communion? It means union with. The C-O-M before At the beginning of the word communion, that prefix means with. So Holy Communion is union with our Lord. But not only should we be united with our Lord when we receive Holy Communion, but that union with Christ should last throughout the day. And we should seek to become more and more united with our Lord. And he will come to us and unite himself to us to the degree that we overcome sin. Sin is the great evil that we must eliminate. And as I said, pride is the source of all sins. And the more we can eliminate sin, the more we eliminate operating for self, the more we are united with our divine Lord and we attain that union. And that's all sanctity is. Our Lord said, be ye perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect, which means that's not just for religious, to strive for perfection. It's true that religious take vows which place them in a state of perfection and make them obligated to strive for perfection. But our Lord wishes to see all of us in our state of life, all of us striving for holiness, striving for, for perfection, even though we will never attain it in this life. That's our goal and our daily effort. And to do that, we have to overcome self. So we pray for the grace to see when we are motivated by selfish concerns, where self is manifesting its life within us. And then after we recognize it, then we work on overcoming self. But I started to say, Sanctity, striving for sanctity. What does it take to become holy? It's really very simple. Sometimes we complicate the recipe for holiness. We think of all of these different things, all of these devotions, all of these different things I have to do. Really, becoming holy is dependent upon two things. One, is the grace of God, without which we can do nothing good. The other 
is our cooperation, without which there is no sanctity. We need these two elements. How do we get the grace of God? Well, first of all, God is granting us graces every day, even when we're not thinking about it. His grace is coming down into our souls. Our Blessed Mother, who's the mediatrix of all graces, dispenses the graces of God to us. But we especially receive grace when we pray, when we pray as devoutly as we can, and above all, when we receive the holy sacraments and attend the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Every Mass we attend is a source of incredible grace. Every time we receive our Lord in Holy Communion, we receive the sacrament of penance, we prepare well, we go to confession, we are receiving an increase of sanctifying grace, we are receiving sacramental grace. Never underestimate the sanctifying power of the sacraments. But your, the sacraments and your prayer life. And, and I want to come back to our prayer life for the latter part of this uh, spiritual conference and talk primarily about that, our prayer life, and especially what we would call recollection, living in the presence of God. Because a lot of us think of prayer life, it's just when we formally pray. We kneel down, we make the sign of the cross, we take out our prayer book or our rosary and we pray. And then we make the sign of the cross and it's done. We need to think more along the terms of praying constantly lifting up our heart to God throughout the day. But more on that later. So prayer and the sacraments obtain for us the graces we need, but then we have to cooperate with them. How often does it happen when you have what I would call an inspiration? You have this inclination, I should do this. I should perform this act of charity. I should give up this Thing, whatever it is that I want. I should make a sacrifice of that. I should say an extra prayer. I should perform this good work. But then self is saying, no, that's, that's too hard. Don't do that. You don't need to do that. And we go through this little struggle. What do we choose? And so you see, the grace of God is necessary, but so is our cooperation. St. Augustine who so incomparable, put it so beautifully. He said, God created us without our efforts, but he will not save us without them. You can have all the graces in the world and you won't advance at all if there's no cooperation. Look at Judas. Our blessed mother prayed for Judas for his repentance and conversion. And he still damned himself. He still fell into despair because he had a free will. Sometimes people will say that, well, I'm praying for my relative. No, mother, father, brother, sister, son, daughter. I'm praying for this person and I pray so much and that person isn't converted. And then they begin to doubt God's goodness or the efficacy of prayer. And they think, what's the use? Why should I pray? Nothing's happening. Well, first of all, a lot is happening. God is giving to that individual, because of your prayers, grace through the hands of our Blessed Mother and maybe an abundance of grace. But God respects the free will he gave us. And God does not force anyone to cooperate with grace. We have a free will. And free will is a wonderful gift, but it's also a dangerous thing. Because there's no soul in hell who is not there because of his own fault. They all used, or I should say misused, their free will to choose evil over good. And that's why they're damned. So we should be afraid of our free will. Say, dear God, I thank you for this gift. Don't let me abuse it. Help me to use my free will to choose thy holy will. So once again, let us never forget, sanctification means we need the grace of God, 
but we also have to, on our part, cooperate with his grace. And the two elements together make up sanctification. You know there's a big thing going on in the world nowadays, especially in the 1980s and 1990s, among teachers of youth in like the public school system. Oh, our young people, we have to make sure that they have self-esteem. How often have you heard that? Self-esteem. We we want youth to grow up and have self-esteem. And it's interesting because it has gotten to such a point that a lot of these young people who go into school where they're never, teachers very careful never to tell them they're wrong. You know, they, they have a wrong answer. Try and get them to find the right answer, but don't mark up their paper. There, there have been so many studies. One of them is don't use red ink, teachers. Don't use red ink because that destroys their self-esteem. That's, gonna, that's just going to make them, you know, as adults, incapable of handling things because they won't have self-esteem. So there's all this mania about self-esteem. And what happens, sometimes young people go through the school system, they become young adults, and they go out into the real world and get a job, and they find out very quickly that all this exaggerated idea they had about their own abilities and their own wonderful excellence is uh, not going to get them anywhere if they don't do what their employer tells them to do. And so there's a disservice done to children by those who have this sense of exaggerating self-esteem. But there's an opposite side to that. And I can see why there are those educators who are so concerned about self-esteem. Because sometimes there is this impression of self that I can't do anything, I'm worthless, etc. And that's not good either. So how do we counter that? Of ourselves, left to ourselves, we are nothing, right? And that, that, and that is fact. Without the grace of God, you can't even perform one meritorious action. But with the grace of God, I can do all things. We have a statue in the back on the right side of Mother Cabrini, and she's holding a book. And on that book, it's open to the epistle of St. Paul, where he said, the words are in Latin, omnia possum ineo qui me confortat. And that means I can do all things in him who strengthens me. And that was her motto. And that was what enabled her to travel back and forth across the ocean and on a donkey over the Andes Mountains and found all these missions. She was tireless. Here's this little woman who had health issues. And yet she was just incredible in what she accomplished. Why? Because she put all her trust in God. I can do all things in him who strengthens me. So you see, she had that right balance. She had a distrust of herself. She knew she was weak. She knew that of herself she could not do any good. But she placed all her trust in our Lord and she worked. She labored for the love of God. And you've all heard that wonderful saying of St. Ignatius of Loyola. He said, pray as though everything depends upon God, and then work as though everything depends on you. You know, there's some people say, well, I'm just going to pray, and then nothing happens. Well, God wants us to do our best, to use our own efforts, and yes, to trust in him for the outcome. So getting back to the self-esteem thing, we should have a proper self-esteem. And what is that? I am a human being created in the image and likeness of God. By baptism, I am an adopted child of God and therefore a brother of Christ, a member of God's family. And God gives me his grace and with his grace I am powerful. Of myself, I am nothing. I can do nothing. But with the grace of God, I can do all things. And you see, that's the proper attitude to have, to avoid either extreme and to place all our trust in God, being aware of our fallen human nature and of our tremendous inclination to evil. 
that we have to always be on our guard against. Now, I mentioned earlier that I would like to spend the balance of this conference speaking about what is referred in different ways in, in the spiritual writing, the spiritual writers, to the presence of God, living in the presence of God, or maintaining recollection. Sometimes people will say to me, people maybe in confession ask for advice or out of the confessional, people will go to a priest and say, I have such a hard time with my prayer life. I come to pray the rosary, and before I know it, the rosary is done, and I hardly meditated at all. I go to Mass, and my mind is wandering here and there. And don't we, let's admit it, don't we all have that difficulty? To be able to pray with attention and devotion, how do we do that? Well, there are two primary means of doing that. One of them is your immediate preparation for prayer. That means right before you start the prayer. Let's take Mass as an example. If you rush into the church every Sunday just on time, you get to your place and you kneel down and the priest is coming out in the altar and say, wow, I made it. Good, I made it on time. You're not going to attend that Mass very well because your immediate preparation was rushing, not being able to be recollected, racing. And I know that some parents of children have a tough time getting everybody ready, getting to Mass in time. But my advice is get there ahead of time. At least strive to be in your place five minutes minimum before Mass begins so that you can be recollected. You can think about what am I doing? I'm going to be assisting at the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the unbloody renewal of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Our Lord is going to come down in the altar. I'm going to be able to receive him as my spiritual food in Holy Communion. There's nothing else going on in the world today other than the other masses going on in the world today. But there's nothing else that even remotely begins to compare with what is going to go on in this chapel in five minutes. And so you see, you think of thoughts like that to dispose yourself to attend Mass with devotion. Same thing when you're going to pray your rosary or your morning prayers or night prayers or your office or whatever. Don't just sit, make the sign of the cross and rush right into it. Stop. Take even if it's 30 seconds and you think about this. I am in the presence of God, my creator. I'm going to speak to him. I'm going to speak to God. I who am nothing. I'm going to strive to lift up my, my heart and soul, my mind, to God. Think of what your needs are. And think of why do we pray? For this spiritual sustenance which we need. So don't just rush right into the prayer. So that's the first thing to pray well, is what I would call the immediate preparation, right before you start the prayer. Try to clear your mind. Put everything else out of your mind. All the other cares you have. You have major things to worry about going on right now. Something broke in your home. Something went wrong. You've got, you've got bills to pay. You've got things going on. Put all of that outside. Right now, none of that matters. I'm going to be speaking with God. So that's your immediate preparation for prayer. But of just as great importance... And in some ways, an even greater importance is what we call the remote preparation for prayer. That means farther removed from the prayer. And that remote preparation is striving to live in the presence of God all the time. Now, I will grant that even for us religious who live for the most part in a religious house, where, where we are far removed from the world, it's difficult to do that throughout the day. We have a stained glass window. The last big one on the right is St. Alphonsus Rodriguez. St. Alphonsus Rodriguez was a lay brother in the Society of Jesus. In fact, he had been married before he became a brother. And he developed a reputation for living in the presence of God all the time. And someone asked him once, and I think it was the superior, so that forced him to answer. 
because everybody knew his sanctity. And the superior said, Alphonsus, how much of the time during the day are you not thinking of God? Are you not in recollection? And he kind of put his head down and he said, about 15 minutes of the day. Can you imagine that? Of his waking hours, there were only about 15 minutes that he wasn't thinking of God. As he did his duties, his heart was lifted up to God. And that's something that we religious strive for constantly. And it would be a good practice for you to strive for. That's what I call the remote preparation for prayer. And some people, people who complain that they can't pray, their mind is constantly distracted. Part of it is that during the day they're so taken up with their daily duties and cares and concerns that it's hard to bring the focus in to prayer when it's time to pray. So how do you cure that? You strive to lift up your heart to God at least from time to time during the day. So that thought of the presence of God is what we call recollection. So one of the ways to acquire it is in your morning offering, you make your morning offering and you offer the day for the love of God. In effect, you say, dear Jesus, Everything I do today, all my prayers, works, joys, sufferings, all my activities, I offer it all for the love of thee, for thy honor and glory. And so from time to time during the day, you renew that intention. You're washing the dishes. You're preparing the meal. You're taking out the trash, whatever it is you think. Dear God, everything I do, even this, is for love of thee even just from time to time, to think of God. I am in the presence of God. My creator beholds me at every moment, wherever I am in the house or out of it. And whatever I'm doing, God is here. He sees me. He knows my most secret thoughts. He is with me at all times. So that's a thought of God. Now, one of the ways that you can cultivate this. And I will grant, it's not easy. It takes a constant application to develop this awareness of the presence of God. But one of the ways you can do it is through the use of ejaculations, those short prayers, like to say, my Jesus mercy. There was a a famous priest in the early 20th century who actually uh, died during World War I because he was a chaplain. But before that time, he had developed quite a reputation for holiness. And he used to give retreats in Ireland, where he was from, and in England. And he was known for his retreats. Everyone recognized his, his holiness. And he wrote in his diary that he kept that he strove to pray ejaculations throughout the day. He strove to pray ejaculations constantly and even wrote because he figured out how many ejaculations he could pray in one minute and then multiplied that by 60 and that would be an hour and so forth. And as he went about his duties, he said ejaculations and he came up with, I don't know, it was a wonderful number of thousands every day of ejaculations. But I would like to suggest to you that you choose a couple of ejaculations and try to pray them during the day. Now, one way to do that is to associate an ejaculation with a physical action. And I'll give you an example. Every time you flip on the light switch in a room, a light, what if you said, eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. So you have let perpetual light shine upon them. You're turning on the light switch. So you're associating a physical action with a prayer. Now, if you conscientiously did that over a period of time, you would find yourself praying that ejaculation every time you flipped on the light switch. It would become second nature. It would become a habit. 
And if you're doing that with the right intention, even when you do it and you don't even think about it, but you say the ejaculation, your intention of forming that habit was to earn graces for the relief of the souls in purgatory. Imagine how many souls you might release, how much suffrage you would obtain for those poor suffering souls by making that a habit. You might do something else. Every time you walk through a doorway, Jesus, Mary, I love you, save souls. We usually add the name of St. Joseph. But that was a beautiful ejaculation that our Lord taught to Sister Consolata Bertrone, an Italian nun who received as private revelations of our Lord in the early part of the 20th century, I think maybe the 1920s, 1930s. And our Lord demanded of her that she would recite that ejaculation, Jesus, Mary, I love you, save souls, over and over and over during the day. But what if we at least made it a practice to say that ejaculation, like I said, when we performed a physical action, like every time we walked up and down a stairs or through a doorway or something of that nature. So just think about that. The benefit of forming a habit. After all, let's start with a small step, saying ejaculations during the day. And our goal is the awareness of the presence of God. Because if we have that, when it comes time for our formal prayer, we will be a lot better recollected and attentive and prayerful. And we'll feel that, not that we're looking for feeling, but we'll know that we prayed better than we used to pray because we have cultivated that recollection during the day. I want to read to you a little section of meditation book I'm currently using that I recently read. And the author here is giving help, advice, to be aware of the presence of God. And this is one on thanksgiving. This is one you can think of during the day. Think of God. We rise in the morning... Thanks, my God, we ought to say to him. Thanks for having kept me during last night, in which so many others have died, and for granting me another day in which to serve thee and to save my soul. We put on our clothes in the morning. Thanks, my God. Many poor have hardly any clothing or only a few rags. We say our morning prayers and make our meditation. I thank thee, my God. Many others have neither the time, nor the thought, nor the goodwill to pray. We move our feet to walk, our hands to act, our tongue to speak. We open our eyes to see and our ears to hear. Thanks, my God. So many others are deprived of the senses which I enjoy. We eat and drink. Thanks, my God. It is a present given me by thy love. So many others have nothing to eat and drink today. We draw in our breath and then exhale it. Thanks, my God. This inhalation is a blessing of thy providence. If thou wert for a single moment to cease dispensing air to me in that very moment, uh, in, in suitable measure and conditions, I should die at that very moment. It was a thought which made St. Gregory Nazianzen say that the remembrance of God ought to be as habitual in me as in breathing. In the evening, we take our rest. Thanks, my God, for having preserved me during this day, in which thou hast taken away life from so many others, and for giving me this night to take the rest so necessary for me, and so forth. What beautiful thoughts, that throughout the day we think of God and we thank him for what we have, for our food, our clothing, our life, our health, our senses, our homes, everything that we have, how seldom we think of thanking God. And yet the saints we read were constantly thinking 
of God, how good God is. What was that saying of St. John Vianney? He would so often say, oh, the good God. And he said it with such emphasis. People were moved just to hear him say, oh, le bon Dieu, the good God. He really understood. It wasn't just a saying that God is good. He understood it. He believed it. And he was grateful how good God is. Good not just in himself, but to me, having given so much to me. And yet, I am so ungrateful. We recently had, last Sunday in fact, the feast of St. Francis of Assisi. What a wonderful saint. And you know his prayer that he would say over and over and over again is, my God and my all. My God and my all. There was a nobleman, a young nobleman in Assisi, who became his very first follower, his first friar minor his first companion, and his name was Bernard, or Bernard, and he admired St. Francis, and he invited him to his house and prepared dinner, and he was really moved by St. Francis, but he wanted to observe him. And so he said, oh, it is late. Why don't you stay here tonight with me? And so he had in his room two beds and he thought, I'm going to see if he really is a saint. What does he do during the night? So he went to bed, and he started breathing regularly as though he were asleep. St. Francis pretended to sleep, and after a while, when St. Francis thought that Bernard was asleep, he got up and knelt down and started praying, my God and my all. And he kept saying the same prayer over and over. You know, we don't have to be complicated in our spiritual life my God and my all. And the next day, Bernard said to St. Francis, I want to be your disciple. I want to follow you. Because he observed that example. So what what did St. Francis teach us there? That he thought of God all the time and he was just overwhelmed by the beauty, the goodness, the greatness of Almighty God. And he loved God and wanted to serve God as best he could in return. So all of this goes back to an awareness of self. St. Louis Marie de Montfort suggests that we pray the prayer of St. Augustine, Lord, grant that I may know myself so that I can come to know thee. We can't really know God until we really understand our weakness, our tendency to evil, and our utter inability of ourselves to do good. But for the grace of God, we are nothing, and we can do nothing without God's help.